of anything they have to offer me, right? It's like, get over yourself, Mark. You've got to... I believe if we could be indivisible, we would be indestructible. Mm. And the best- Hype after this, I don't mean to ask you to put you on the spot to say, tell us what's going to happen in the future, but tell us what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> Good. everyone welcome to another episode of keep leading live keep leading live is dedicated to leadership development and insights i'm your host eddie turner i work with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact through the power of professional speaking executive coaching and masterful facilitation if you're tuned in to the, one of the three places we're streaming live, let us know you're here. We're streaming live on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. I don't always see the comments, but when I do see your comments, we will acknowledge your comments and feel free to ask a question of my guest today. And if you're not already following him, I'm going to encourage you to follow him. Hit the share button so that your uh, colleagues can get a chance to watch the recording later on. And if, if they see it right away, then even they can join the conversation with you. You're never in the room when your career is decided for you. This is a quote by Jennifer Colosimo that appears in the book, Career on Course by Scott Jeffrey Miller. Since you're not in a room and decisions are made about your career, the encouragement is act or be acted upon. Scott Jeffrey Miller is a highly sought after speaker who has written seven books, including this new bestseller. He's a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, in fact. Scott spent 25 years at Franklin Covey, culminating in his appointment as the chief marketing officer and Executive Vice President of Thought Leadership. He now serves as Franklin Covey's Senior Advisor on Thought Leadership and hosts the show on Leadership, which is the world's largest weekly leadership podcast. This is no ordinary podcast. This uh, this show has had uh, Alan Mulally, the former chair of Boeing and Ford, uh, prolific author Malcolm Gladwell, Professor Amy Edmondson, Simon Sinek, Matthew McConaughey, Michael Bungay Stanker, Tim Grover, Ursula Burns, Jim Clare, and so many more. Uh, pulling up the bottom of that list would be yours truly. It's one of the best shows I've had the privilege of being on. It is my favorite to this day. He's also the founding partner uh, of Gray Miller, a speaking, literary, and talent agency. So if you're looking for great talent, looking for your next speaker, you want to go to visit this website because he's he boasts clients such as Seth Godin, Susan David, Kim Scott, Michael Hyatt, Carly Fiorina, and so many more great people. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to Scott Jeffrey Miller. Scott, welcome to Keep Leading. Eddie, it's an honor. Delighted for your spotlight in the platform today. Great to be back with you, my friend. You and I have been friends for a couple of years now. We've traded podcast uh, uh, insights and guests as well. So delighted to be joining you from Florida. I live in Utah, but I'm in Florida this week on some professional pursuits and here to see a friend as well. So excited to have a conversation about getting our careers back on track and being more intentional and less accidental. Yes, and that's the title of what we're going to talk about, taking your career from accidental to incidental uh, and intentional, rather, accidental to intentional. And yes, you're one of my few repeat guests. 
uh, if folks were paying attention to the opening uh, video, uh, they would have saw your episode that we did two or three years ago, and you delivered tremendous insights. I'm a repeat because I, I think I came. stalked you, begging to come back on, and you finally relented. <laughs> so, uh, hey, nope. intentional careers are relentless, right? And it's relentless, so I, uh, at least, if anything, I'm a good model of that. <laughs> Indeed, you are. And uh, we've got a reaction from uh, Gabby Liz Cano, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She sends a love. Uh, yeah, there he's in the us. house. Woo, woo. So someone that you know, very good. Well, tell our, our listeners a little bit more about you that they yeah. should know. Well, so I live in Salt Lake City, Utah with my wife and our three young sons that are 9, 12, and 13, and they're giving her an emotional breakdown. So I'm racing home tonight to save my marriage and her sanity. I'm originally from Florida. I worked for the Walt Disney Company for four years until they invited me to leave. So where does a single Catholic boy from Orlando move? Well, to Provo, Utah, where all the Catholics were 25 years ago. I'm kidding. There wasn't a single Catholic in Provo, Utah. And I joined the Franklin Covey Company, Stephen Covey's company, and spent 25 amazing years there, living around the world in Utah and London and Chicago. Um, like you, I'm privileged to host a fairly popular podcast now. I've authored seven books on leadership, marketing, mentorship, and career. Most of my time is spent keynote speaking. And as you mentioned, I uh, co-own uh, a burgeoning talent speaking and literary agent as well, representing clients around the world. And I'm very passionate about developing people's careers, helping them learn from the successes and setbacks that I had and others in my realm had. And so that's a little bit about me. That's fantastic. And I want to just uh, briefly show a copy of the book for those that may not have seen it, would like to see what we're talking about. And if you find this book of interest, of course, there are seven others that we've, as we've Agreed. mentioned, Agreed. that uh, he has uh, produced. So you said something very interesting in your intro that I'm not sure I caught before, but I like how you said it now. And because we're talking about careers, let's talk about that. Uh, the positive framing, I love it. You said you worked for the happiest place on earth, which at a certain point invited you, you said, to, uh, to, to find leave. another employment. <laughs> so how did you bounce back from that? <laughs> I cleaned it up a little bit. You know, I'll tell you, I, I was very young. I worked for Disney, had a great career on the real estate development side, the corporate side, right? Everybody there had an Ivy League education, except for me. And it actually was an internship at a college. I turned it into a full-time job for four years because I'm crafty and wrong culture, wrong time, right? I had nothing but great, great things to say about the people, the leadership and the organization, but it wasn't right for me. It was a hometown employer. I learned a ton and a little bit of a bull in a China shop. And then they uh, you know, encouraged me to seek my profession elsewhere. I tell you, you know, the worst day of your life is the day you're fired. The best day of your life is the next day when you realize they just released you from something you probably didn't have enough courage to release yourself from, right? Bad leader or a bad culture or a bad whatever it was, of which those weren't the case at Disney. It just wasn't the right place for me. Uh, Stephen Covey recruited me, um, came out and worked for that company for almost 30 years, had an amazing career front line, selling their leadership solutions around the world to become the chief marketing officer for a decade there. And so I, you know, being fired does, isn't like a badge of shame for me. People get terminated. I've terminated 18 people in my career. And when I see them in airports, I have no hard feelings. They might not like me, but you know, all of us aren't always in the right fit. So it was really my departure from the Walt Disney company that helped me realize, you know, I need to take better control of my brand. Mm -hmm. I need to be more deliberate with my career decisions and less impulsive. I need to think carefully through what kind of culture and with who do I want to associate with. And this book, Career on Course, is all about taking these 10 strategies and becoming less accidental, less impetuous, less impulsive, and much more deliberate and intentional, which I think is tough. Our mutual friend, Dory Clark, wrote this phenomenal book, you know, um, you know how to think long-term in a short-term world. And so I, I'm passionate about this concept of helping people just take more deliberate control and not give mm -hmm. up control of their career to other people. Because Excellent. like you said, you know, act or be acted upon, disrupt or be disrupted. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that book by our good friend, Dory Clark is entitled the long, long game. game. Yeah. So taking that long Excellent. rising. 
Yeah, and so you you make a good point that you had to go through. Number one, being released isn't bad. At times, it gives us the chance to do something we didn't have the courage to do. I like how you pointed that out, and that now we realize, okay, let's get going with what's next. And that is what we often need to find that next blessing, that next great moment in our careers that we would not have found otherwise. And uh, kind of similar to relationships too. <laughs> isn't that true, right? Yeah. In that sad relationship that and now that you're, you're free, you got that next person, you never knew you'd have love in such a great way. So it's one of the points that you mentioned in your 10 strategies. And we're going to go through as many of these as we can in this short time. But one of those strategies, you talk about the need to uh, build and own our brand. Tell us why that is so important. Well, I mean, this is not a new concept, right? Everybody has a brand, either intentional or accidental. Your brand is the collection of all the decisions you've made, all the promises you've kept or missed. So I think it's super important for people to assess what is my brand. And by the way, how you present your brand may not have any correlation to how it's received by others, right? I think I'm a fairly positive, great guy, and I'm sure I grade on people and probably I'm quite annoying to some people, and no doubt I have detractors. Your brand, however, is how you are received. And so one of the strategies is to really do a, a kind of a sobering assessment of what do you think your brand is? Interview three other people and ask them what they think your brand is, identify what the gaps are, because no doubt there are gaps, and then decide what do you want your brand to be? It's never too late to change your brand. And, and is the brand you want for yourself the, the brand that your organization you work for values? You may, you may have a brand that your company doesn't value. So you decide, do I want to change my brand or do I want to change my company? And so this Excellent. is not a big, big new idea, but it's an idea I don't think most people do the self-reflection around to really assess what do I think my brand is? What do other people think my brand is? And what is the disconnect or chasm between what I intentionally want it to be and what kind of behaviors, mindsets, tool sets do I need to adopt to create the brand I want? You have a brand. And if you haven't created it intentionally, you have created it accidentally. Yes. Regardless, though, you have a brand. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, for me, this I went back to school as an adult late in life and got my degree. But the very first night at Northwest University that I started that program, the game changer for my career was they invited back uh, alumna, Catherine Caputa, who had mm. just written the book, You Are a Brand. Yeah. I would never heard that concept before, but that was the beginning of me going through the metamorphosis that I went through. So you make another point very related to that, very much related to that. In terms of the brand you're building, are you going to be a specialist yes. or a generalist? Now, I did some work with Andrew Sobel uh, at a firm uh, in 2009, and he used the phrase deep generalist and deep specialist. Yes. yes. And from that moment, I went, yes, that's me. I'm not just one thing. I have many passions, and here's yeah. how I bring all of these into the workplace. So talk about why you make that point in your new book and the, the meaning of this for leaders today. Thank you, Eddie. Before I do that, I want to just go back real quickly to your concept around brand. You are an excellent example of this, right? You have a very, very deliberate, intentional brand. Not in this order, but you are a gentleman. <laughs> I know you well enough to know you do not disparage people. You hold confidences. When something doesn't go the way you want it to, you don't air the dirty laundry. I mean, you are a classic gentleman. You are very punctual. You are competent. You have high character. You are always impeccably dressed. You have an abundance mentality. You promote people's podcasts and their books. I mean, you have a very carefully calibrated brand. Now, my expectation is that your brand publicly is congruent with your values and who you are personally. That's not my experience, but you are a perfect example of someone who consistently shows up the same way. And I think people, if they want to know more about how to craft a brand, hire Eddie to give a, a keynote or a consult or coach on that. Now, to answer your question, this is strategy number two. Are you a specialist? Or are you a generalist? I co-opted it from David Epstein's book, Range, who I give him credit for in the book. Oh, I've got that book. Nominal yes. book, Range. And yes. for me, it was especially uh, insightful because 
like you, I'm a generalist. You know, I, I was raised in a family that valued specialists. My parents valued stability <clears throat> over anything in our family. They were both raised in very unstable families. So my mom and dad valued stability over joy, laughter, physical touch, caring, warmth. It was all about stability. And so my brother, when he became a chemical engineer, he went and got the badge, right? Because they very much valued anything that brought stability. My brother went on to MIT and he got an MBA. And so my brother is the favorite child. We know this. We laugh about it. <laughs> he, you know, he sent me uh, black sheep cufflinks one year. So he that. So, so my parents this day still do not know how I earn a living. Like well, he was a realtor and he's in sales and public relations and marketing and has a podcast and is an author. And he's an, my parents have no idea. And quite frankly, I've never valued my career, even though I probably out earned my brother three to one. But because I'm a generalist, I was raised in a family that only valued specialist. I read David Epstein's book and I realized, oh my gosh, I'm so liberated. So generalists can also feel great about their careers. I really wrote this chapter out there for the generalist because if they were like me, they find themselves in what I call the comparison conundrum. They're comparing their trajectories, their skill sets, their competence, their relevancy to anesthesiologists and to you know, plumbers, electricians, people that, you know, wear the badge. I don't have a badge. I never earned the badge. And so I just reminded generalists that it's going to be okay. Had someone told me I was 22, Scott, it's going to be okay. Learn all these skills, sales, marketing, operations, supply chain. Cause you know what? Those are the skills that they want in a CEO. Mm -hmm. And usually generalists are a little more late bloomers. So I wrote this chapter to say, by the way, you can be a specialist inside of a generalist. You can be a generalist inside of a specialty. I said, don't get caught up on that. I wrote this to say, specialist, kudos to you. I'm glad you knew you wanted to be a veterinarian in third grade. You can't be my yes. friend because I'm too jealous of you. <laughs> but I wrote this chapter for the generalist who, like me, kind of wandered a bit in our early 20s, maybe 30s and say, listen, go follow your passions. However, knit them together crochet them together because they can't just be episodic skills. You've got to knit them together in something that someone wants to pay for. And I think if you look at modern day CEOs, executive directors, presidents of companies, these are people that were probably generalists that knitted together all these backgrounds, but they realized the benefit a little later in life. And therefore, if you have children or if you're younger, Give yourself a little permission to be a generalist, but work them together over time so you put them together as a package to accomplish what it is you want to. Well, really good advice, really good advice. And the other reason that's important is I came out of the GE world where the mantra was do more with less, and by the way, do it faster. Hmm. So being a generalist served me in a lot of ways because I, I was not so reliant on this one skill set. I was able to do multiple things, and especially as things were being streamlined, I was, uh, Got kind of insulated to a degree from that, being able to to deploy multiple skills across the horizon. Well, I also now, think with the with that with the onslaught of AI, it's going to mm -hmm. just you know yes, it's going to change our world in ways we can't even articulate. I think those who are generalists and have broad skill sets will be more adaptable and more easy to self disrupt and pivot. No question about it. In fact, in the Financial Times on Monday, uh, the article was about the fastest growing role in the C suite is the chief AI officer. Oh, wow. Yeah. And of course, right. part of the, the argument among the tech folks is, hey, there's an, enough positions in the C-suite already, including the chief information officer and chief data officer, where is this role gonna go, right? Yeah. But yeah. that's what the Financial Times is highlighting for that very reason that you mentioned. You make a, a very interesting point in your book. I wanna, I wanna read this verbatim, if I may. Uh-oh. You say that the, here are the top five reasons people get hired. So to your point about pulling that all together, the, 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 the general relation so that you specialize, you can be able to have something to offer that an employer is willing to pay for. What you mentioned here is intriguing to me for one reason. I'm going to uh, just read these. Uh, the top five reasons people get hired. Number one, they are engaging. Number two, they focus on what they can do for the organization, not what the organization can do for them. Number three, they have an established track record. Number four, they don't hide their gaps 
And finally, number five, they have a history of grit and determination. Nowhere in this list of five, and then you go on to explain all these in the book, uh, do I see their degree, yeah. <laughs> the school yeah. they went to, some yeah. of the other items we normally point to. So please explain that for our listeners in whole or in part. Well, a couple of things. So uh, like you, I have interviewed, uh, well, I've interviewed over a thousand people for the three podcast and iHeart radio program that I've hosted. And whenever I interview a CEO or a president, I ask them, so what skills are you looking for in new hires? Never is it coding, technology, AI, even like the CEO of Intel or the CEO of Oracle or Ford or Exxon or Chevron. All of them say, I'm looking for people who can manage their emotions, people who are self-aware, people who can communicate, people who can reduce their thoughts to writing, people who manage uh, their body language, who can read the emotions of people around them. They're all EQ skills. They're never IQ skills because those are a given now, right? I mean, you got to have the education to get the job. 85% of all new hires come from someone they're referred in by. And so I'll go with the top, the first one, which is, uh, you know, how engaging are you? I call it your barbecue factor. I think this is very important. Whether you are an extrovert or an introvert, you have a barbecue factor. And this is, in essence, is if I was to invite you, Eddie, to my home for a Saturday barbecue, what would the experience be like with you? You know, would you show up? Would you say you were going to show up, but you didn't show up? Would you bring five friends unannounced? Would you bring a housewarming gift, a bottle of wine, a candle? Would you, you know, take your shoes off and not assume that I'm a, you know, shoe house or not shoe house? You know, would you manage the grill? Would you, you know, have a beer or have a glass of lemonade? Would you help pick up? Would you join in some of the games? Would you be an intellectual conversationalist? Would you move outside your comfort zone? Would you stick around and, you know, help me clean up? You get the point. I, I'm not saying extrovert or introvert. I'm just like, what are your people skills. I call it your barbecue factor. The and everybody has factor. one. <laughs> and, it, and, and it may require you to move outside of your natural comfort zone. You know, people think I'm an extrovert. I'm actually an introvert masquerading as an extrovert because I think that's important in society. And so I do think you need to be engaging in the interview process. I think you should match your energy without becoming someone you're not. But it's just that ability to be agile and work in different environments and move outside of your comfort zone. I hate cocktail parties where the conversation is just mindless, but it's part of being a friend. It's part of networking. It's part of being comfortable, being uncomfortable. And so of all of those, this may sound like the most shallow one, but I think it's one of the most important to recognize what are you like in different situations and are you willing to move with some effort Mm -hmm. and make it look a little bit effortless. Excellent, excellent, excellent. The barbecue factor, that's a new one for me. I, I love it. And uh, by the way, you mentioned something earlier that I think matters here too, that, you know, um, detractors. You mentioned that you have some detractors, and certainly I know I do. And one person said it very nicely, that if you don't have detractors, that means you're doing something wrong. So in being intentional about our career, it should oh. not be a matter of wanting to be a people pleaser. Uh, if you are doing what you're supposed to be doing and truly leading, you're going to make some people uh, kind of sore at you. Well, let me tell you, uh, I'm going to challenge you on that because you're right. If you don't have detractors, you aren't, you know, you aren't making progress. But you have detractors. You just don't know because you're not self-aware enough. Everybody yes. has detractors. I'm amazed at how often... I'll give keynote speeches and say, everyone raise your hand if you've got a best friend in the workplace and every hand goes up. And then I'll say, or some question like that, I'll say, raise your hand if you've got a detractor, an enemy, a detractor, someone who doesn't like you. And half the audience won't raise their hands. And I'll say, so really no one doesn't like you? Well, gosh, I can't think of someone. I'm like, I can think of 14 people in one division at Franklin Covey who don't like me. I could name you 70 people who wish I wasn't alive in the world. They post on Glassdoor and YouTube about eight times a week about me. And it doesn't impact me, but I know it's out there because I'm self-aware. I don't have my head in the sand. I read their comments once a month with my son and we laugh at all their comments. Well, that was mean, that was cruel. Well, yes, I did that. Yes, I do that. Yes, that can be annoying. But I mean, I think it's so important to know who your detractors are. 
and then just put them in context and say, hey, do they not like me for reasons that I should care about? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Indeed. So you, you're starting to do a little bit. Of, I think it's Jimmy Kimmel who does the. We do it. We, the, we park out on our celebrities our, come on and, and read the hate tweets. Our driveway. <laughs> we pull up the screen. We go like through it. all the YouTube comments that are basically people all saying you shouldn't be alive. You are not competent. <laughs> you're a scourge on society. Re Re Reddit is the most evil one, and then Glassdoor, and then YouTube. Well, it's good that you're able to look at that and maintain a healthy view uh, of who you are in spite of it. That's Hopefully. excellent. Yeah. Well, we've got about a couple minutes left here in our session. So if you're tuned in, it looks like Erastus Mack has joined us from the Facebook side. we got some folks on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have a question for Scott and about careers, we want to invite you to go ahead and uh, ask that question now, if you would, as we conclude. Okay. Uh, Scott. Um, also, I want to share, if you haven't tuned into On Leadership, here's what I want to share this really quick. This is what it looks like when you tune into that show. And I'm showing this. Why are you showing because, me? You should be showing you because this is your book and you're the guest. Why are you showing me? Because I want people to see all those other books you have behind you. Uh, well, you mentioned a book earlier that I went, oh, yeah, I bought that. I didn't re finish reading it. So range, I'm going to have to go back and finish yeah. reading it. Range, yeah. you have to finish reading that now. I said, um, Eddie. Your book was phenomenal. Your book was a compendium. I mean, you did a lot of work on pulling together some of the greatest insights of leadership. I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. Easy to digest, start anywhere, go everywhere. It's why your book is on the wall somewhere in that studio that's a lot larger than that clip is. But Well, I appreciate that. The ones at the front are definitely far more important than mine. But now, yours I want folks to tune into your show because that's what this was about. Uh, just a phenomenal show to be able to listen to, to watch, and uh, yeah, really, really good stuff. On the Keep Leading podcast, I always ask people, what's a quote that you use to help you keep leading? Oh, I would say, you know, have a plan or become part of someone else's. Uh, you know, not everyone has bad motives. A lot of people have great motives and being a part of their plan may be a good thing, but you know, you open the podcast sharing that quote from Jennifer Colosimo, you're never in the room when your career is decided for you. And when I heard that, I was horrified. I'm like, that is repugnant, but piercingly true. You aren't in the room when your career is decided for you. Think about that. What happens up in the C-suite and they close the curtains and they put up all the names on the chart pad for who might be a candidate for the Western region directorship or the new product development role, or we have an office open in the London office or a position open. And so have a plan. You know, I think it is the fourth strategy in the book Career on Course is illustrate and recalibrate your long-term plan. You're, you're going to have a 50-year career. Think about it, 21 to 71 for most of us. You're going to have a 50-year career. Check the balance in the Social Security the Trust. You're going to have a 50-year career. And if the average age of the new career, the average lifespan is 18 to 24 months, you're going to have 25 careers. To me, I don't want that. I don't want to learn 25 new cultures and 25 more processes and 25 new leaders. You should take control of your career. Have a plan, have a multi-decade plan. The reason why most careers are accidental is because everybody's thinking about what's next. They're not thinking about what's after what's next. Think about your career 20, 30, 40 years from now. Pick the ultimate goal and then back cast, reverse engineer it and build that plan for yourself because your likelihood of achieving your plan, as you know, is exponentially higher when you have a plan versus when you don't. Simple indeed. but profound advice for your career. Simple but profound indeed. And is there one last message you'd like to leave people with who have tuned in to know about how they can be more intentional and less accidental about their career, Scott? You cannot be intentional with your career if you don't know what your professional values are. And this is a little bit controversial in the values world because I think you wanna have a list of personal values and a list of professional values. My number one professional value is to maximize my income. And I am very comfortable and confident expressing that in a professional setting. You need to take the time to, to, to complete the first exercise to create your list of personal professional values. They change when your roles change and then make your decisions in life personally and professionally through those lenses. You cannot have a deliberate, intentional career if you have not taken the time to identify your professional values. And sometimes they're in conflict with your personal values, and that's okay. 
but you won't know why your career is in a cul-de-sac in circles if you haven't determined, am I making decisions based on my personal values or my professional values? Are they aligned? Are they in conflict? What excellent, excellent advice. Thank you for sharing that. And share with us where we can learn more. I'm gonna put it at the bottom of the screen here, career on course book. Dot com, well, but anything else people should know about how they can find out about you? Well, I'm kind of hard not to miss, my wife says, and she means that as not a compliment. You can follow me on LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X, YouTube. I'm everywhere. You can visit scottjeffreymiller.com. You can Google on leadership. This book is called Career on Course. There's a website called careeroncoursebook.com. If you Google Scott Miller, I'm likely to come up. Excellent. So we've got that going across the streamer there at the bottom. Thank and you, the Eddie. reason I, I put that one there is because the other links to the sites he just mentioned are also found at the bottom of that as well. Yep. But yes, follow Scott Jeffrey Miller. And if you're looking for your next speaker, go to his agency page that's on there as well. Your next speaker, your next uh, book publication. Uh, he does it all. <laughs> Scott, thank you for being a guest on Keep Leading. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in for this session. This concludes this episode. I'm Eddie Turner, the Leadership Accelerator, reminding you that leadership is about action. It's activity. It's not about our title or our position. We must be a leader at our core and allow it to emanate in all we do. So whatever you're doing, always, Keep leading.